Well, it's my great privilege and joy to invite you to open up your copy of God's Word this morning to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 is where we'll look together, and we'll begin together in verse 13 and study down through verse 27. So Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, this is what the Word of God says. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones! And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we cry out with the prophet Isaiah this morning saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. God, how we pray that you would open our eyes to see more of your glory today, to see the radiance of the glory of God revealed in the pages of Scripture as we behold your Son. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us now by your word and that your Holy Spirit would stir our hearts with a hope that can only be found in Christ. For we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. Don't know about you, but one of the things among many things in life that uh, I really struggle with, I really loathe, is the annual visit to the eye doctor. Uh, I've got to admit that that appointment for an exam is one of those uh, scheduled appointments that I don't particularly look forward to. If you're an optometrist in the room, I, I mean no offense because on the one hand, I am immensely grateful for the work. Uh, contact lenses and glasses have been a part of my life since I was a teenager. Uh, but on the other hand, I just don't enjoy getting my eyes dilated Right, looking into that machine, waiting for that little puff of smoke to puff in my eye as I try to focus in on that little red dot, trying not to blink. Uh, I don't particularly enjoy when a person's face is right up in my face and they're staring back into the depths of my eye. It's a very intimate experience. But you know, one of the most dislikable things for me about going to the eye doctor is realizing that I do not see things as clearly as I would like to believe that I can. As I begin to read those letters off on a distance on the wall, testing my sight, and I read off X, B, Y, Z, H, and then the doctor turns over that corrective lens asking me, is it clear lens one or two? Is it one or is it two? Well, then I begin to see that I, what I thought was once clear on the wall was actually mistaken. I need a new lens to see what is true. And you know, so often in our Christian lives, what we need more than anything is the corrective lenses of the scriptures to help us to truly see. 
In order to interpret life in its unfolding circumstances, we need to look not to our own perceptions, but we look into the very word of God and then we begin to see through the lens of truth. We see things as they really are. As we turn to our text this morning, what we find are two disciples who are in serious need of the corrective lenses of the scriptures. Now, these are two disciples, one named Cleopas and uh, the other, we don't have a name recorded. And these two disciples are walking along a road from Jerusalem, weighed down by disappointment and grief as they think about the death of Jesus and what to make of his empty tomb. What they come to discover is not that they have perceived those events clearly, but it's that they need their sight reframed and reoriented around the truth of God's word and who Jesus is and what he came into the world to do. What you and I need to see from this text today is that living by hope in Christ is not found in what we can perceive in our lives, but it's in what the scriptures reveal. What we need to set before our eyes today and every day is the very word of God where Christ is revealed from its beginning to its end. This passage, it describes a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem into a little town called Emmaus, and it's the first of three resurrection narratives that we find in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the only one of the four gospel writers who includes the Emmaus Road scene, and it's been called by some as one of the most beautiful narratives in all of the scriptures. New Testament scholar Daryl Bach has said that this appearance of Jesus upon the Emmaus Road is one of the most vivid and dramatic accounts about Jesus. Luke tells the event with great skill and drama. It's fascinating that his readers know more about this stranger who travels with Cleopas and his companion than they do, and this only adds to its intrigue. This is certainly a vivid and uh, intriguing passage, and the two major movements in the text that I believe Luke wants us to see are first in verses 13 to 24, where we see what it looks like to walk without hope in life. And then in verses 25 to 27, where we see the place that hope is found. So number one, walking without hope. And then secondly, the place where hope is found. Uh, Luke here, he begins with a picture of what it looks like to walk without hope in life. The scene meets the disciples and it meets you and I in the places where we have been most disappointed in our lives. The places where we cannot make sense of what God is doing and despite our best attempts, we cannot grasp his sovereign purposes. This description of the opening scene from 13 to 24 is really a a picture of broken dreams and dashed hopes. When I think about the beginning of this walk from Jerusalem, I think about what it's like to leave a graveside service. In that moment, all of the Hugs have been given, the prayer has been prayed, tears are being shed, and you walk up to that casket and you know that you'll never see this person again in this life. And there's a disparity to the moment. There's a finality to that moment as you begin to to walk away. And that's something of what has taken place in the hearts of these disciples. Their hope had died when Jesus died on the cross, and their hope was shattered when the body of Jesus was placed into the tomb. We read in verse 13 that that very day, which was the the first day of the week, was a Sunday, uh, after the women had found the tomb empty that morning, that two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, We don't know exactly where Emmaus was at. Most believe it's somewhere west of Jerusalem, but there's no definitive answer to where this city was. What we do know is what Luke tells us, that just after the Passover had taken place, just after Jesus had been crucified, buried in the tomb, and now word had begun to spread three days later that the tomb was empty, 
that these two were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Uh, One of the things that I love about Luke 24, amongst many things, is that on the heels of the greatest supernatural event in human history, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that here in verse 13, the historian and Dr. Luke takes us to a little road with a couple of no-name disciples simply walking and talking and going to a small town. This is common everyday life with ordinary people. And it's there in the normalcy of human life as they are walking and talking and discussing with one another all these things that had happened over the previous few days in Jerusalem, that there the resurrected Christ draws near. It's in that very moment that the transcendent creator God becomes imminent with them. The second person of the Trinity enters into their heartache and their sorrows and all of the mundaneness in life. See, Jesus... He isn't strutting in to see the Jewish Sanhedrin and scheduling an appointment with Caiaphas like I would be tempted to do. Imagine that moment. He walks in and he says, hey boys, it's good to see you. What he's doing is he he isn't scheduling an appointment with Pontius Pilate to, to let him know that he is that true King of Kings and that Lord of Lords. Jesus isn't revealing himself to this massive crowd so all can behold him in his resurrected glory. No, Jesus in his first resurrection appearance in the Gospel of Luke, he walks down a little road with a couple of disciples that we barely know anything about. Jesus enters into the normalcy of life. He steps into what is ordinary, and he continues to do the same thing today. You see, Jesus draws near among normal people in normal places with normal lives. He draws near in the humble, routine aspects of life, and most certainly in our heartaches and in our sorrows. Jesus draws near to us, not just in a church building, but in all of the ordinary humdrum moments of daily life, in your morning commute, there in your living room, as you're out with friends and family, Jesus draws near. And what's striking about this scene is that even as Jesus approaches these disciples, his own followers cannot recognize him. Their eyes are kept from seeing Jesus, and instead of rejoicing in this resurrected Messiah, all they can do is talk in circles about what they've lost. And so Jesus says to them in verse 17, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. What do you mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about the only thing that anybody is talking about. The thing that has broken our hearts. That word sad there, it could also mean gloomy, mournful, dejected. They say to Jesus in verse 21, we had hoped that Jesus of Nazareth was the one to redeem Israel. And this was a past hope. Hope was gone. They were dejected and hopeless even though the resurrected Christ was with them and he walked with them. And notice with me that Luke makes no mention of the scriptures being discussed by these two. There's no mention or recollection of the words of Jesus when he was with them. But all they are discussing, all they are focused in on is what we see in verse 14, the things that had happened. They cannot move beyond the horrors of the cross and their own interpretations of what took place there. Sometimes we can't move beyond our own painful experiences, our own trials and difficulties in our own lives. We can't see beyond them. We can't understand what God is doing or understand what he's done to us or to the people that we love. But seeing their master brutally murdered upon a Roman cross was not what they had anticipated. A crucified Christ was not a part of our plan. And I think what this teaches you and I 
is that when we live by our own perceptions in life, we may miss what God is doing right in front of us. As John Piper has so helpfully said, God is so often doing a thousand things in your life, and you may only be aware of three of those things. You see, when, when we live by what we think, what we see, what we experience, what we feel, instead of walking in the truth of what the Bible says, it can so narrow our perspective down that we find ourselves in utter despair and without hope. Maybe you've said to yourself recently, is God really at work in this broken world? Is he really at work in my broken life? Is there any kind of future for the church of tomorrow? And brothers and sisters, with Jesus, there is always so much more than meets the eye. What appeared to be his greatest failure in the cross was actually the fulfillment of his ultimate triumph. The cross of Christ teaches us that things are not always as they appear to be. Now, I love the irony in the question from Cleopas in verse 18. He's talking to Jesus about Jesus, and he says to him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Uh, The one who was the very focal point of all that had unfolded in Jerusalem doesn't turn to Cleopas and say, hey, Cleopas, it's me, Jesus, If you've ever wondered if Jesus has a sense of humor, let verse 19 be one of those places that you call to mind, because what he does is he turns to Cleopas and he says, what things? And he asks them questions. He draws out their hearts. And and what they say in response is filled with truth, but it's not the whole truth. What they say in verses 19 to 24 is so right, and yet it is so wrong. What they say in response revolves around Jesus of Nazareth, and and here's what they get right. Verse 19, he was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Jesus certainly was a prophet who spoke with divine power. He exercised a supernatural ability to give sight to the blind and to raise the dead to life by his very voice. They say in verse 20, our chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. That's absolutely right. Jesus was betrayed and he was unjustly sentenced to die at Calvary's cross. He uttered at the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last breath. They say in verse 22, some women of our company were at the tomb earlier this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Again, That is accurate. Jesus is no longer in the tomb. Joanna, Mary, and the other women had seen something that the other disciples had not believed. They say back in verse 11 of this chapter that this is an idle tale. They think this is a made-up story by these well-intentioned but misguided women. For all you ladies, if there's ever a place where the women get it right before the men, Luke 24 is that place. But all that they have just communicated about Jesus of Nazareth is accurate, but here's the problem. Verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They can't accept what these women have seen and heard. And notice how Jesus responds amongst many things in verse 25. He says, you are slow to believe, here's the word, all that the prophets have spoken. These two, they are so close in putting the the puzzle together of all that has unfolded from Friday into Sunday regarding Jesus of Nazareth, and yet they cannot put it all together. They've got all the right pieces, but they're missing this bigger picture, this fuller picture of who Christ is. 
And the issue is not a lack of information. The issue is not a lack in intellectual capacities, but the issue is a deeper problem of the heart in unbelief. They could not fathom a Messiah who would be crucified, a king who would be stricken, who would be beaten and rejected and nailed to a cross. Well, they anticipated this king's glory, but not his sufferings. They anticipated his crown, but, but not his cross. And you see, the problem for these early disciples and the problem for so many of us today is we neglect all that the scriptures say. You and I, we can be guilty of reading the Bible very selectively, seeing only what we want to see in its pages. The way that these disciples read the Old Testament and the way that they have listened even to the words of Jesus was filtered through their own picture of who the Messiah would be and what he would do. And so they had crafted a Christ of their own liking. And they may have looked into various places in the Bible. They may have looked to Psalm 2, which speaks of a, a son, a begotten son of the Father who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's the king I'm in for. They may have been drawn to texts like Daniel 7, which speaks of the Son of Man who will be given dominion and glory and a kingdom that will never pass away. Oh, that's the kingdom that I've signed up for. But what they neglected, notice again, is the words of all that the prophets had spoken. They had no category for the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 or uh, the God-forsaken cries of the Lord's anointed in Psalm 22. As often as they had heard Jesus tell them plainly about his death and resurrection, they did not believe him. And so they had fashioned a king of their own making, and it clouded their vision of who he was and what he came to do. And Jesus had told them back in Luke 18, beginning in verse 31, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon, and after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. Jesus had told them exactly what was about to take place in Jerusalem. These disciples are saddened and dejected, but it's, it's not because of a lack of clarity, but it's due to a slowness of heart that fails to believe. And friends, let this serve as a reminder to us that we cannot cherry pick the things that we prefer in the Bible to the neglect of the things that we find to be distasteful. We don't have the permission to create a Jesus of our own liking or a king who is built around our own preferences. But we come and we receive all that the scriptures have to say to us. So we like to say around here, it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And we could add to that, that it takes a whole Bible to see the true Jesus. That's why it's important that we see that books like Obadiah and Deuteronomy and Jeremiah help us to hope in Jesus Christ. Books like Ezekiel and Leviticus and the Psalms help us to hope in Christ. All that the prophets have spoken matter in helping us to see Jesus for who he is. And so after listening to Cleopas and his companion ramble about what to make of the events in the empty tomb, Jesus then speaks a gracious but a firm word of rebuke. You know, sometimes what we need when we find ourselves in that place of utter despair is someone who will lovingly but also truthfully speak what is right, what is true into our lives. And Jesus does that here. He directs these disciples and he directs you and I to the place where hope is found. He takes them to the lens by which we can see. And he said to them in verse 25, Oh, foolish ones, 
and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. See, what these disciples needed to truly see Jesus was actually not to see the resurrection of Christ. If that were the case, walking with Jesus in that moment would have been enough. But no, what they needed was greater insight, greater clarity into what the word revealed. And you see, hope is always found in the scriptures, which must be the focus of our attention. Romans 15, 4 says, for whatever was written in former days, meaning the Old Testament, it was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope, hope, hope. You know, when I was a, a kid, Growing up in church, I can remember different ways that adult leaders and youth groups would model for me and my friends different ways that we should approach the Bible. Whether they knew it or not, they were modeling for us biblical hermeneutics, the ways that we should interpret and understand the Bible. But I can remember being a student and seeing the different ways that leaders would make sense of the scriptures, and to be honest, it wasn't always the most helpful. Uh, youth groups can be infamous for these sorts of things, not this youth group at Parkside, our, our leaders are stellar, but, but youth groups in different places. But I can remember that some would sit and talk with us about a verse or two, and the questions that they would ask are, are what do you guys think about these verses? Or how do these verses make you feel? And what we would do is we would talk in circles and share our opinions about what everybody had to say, and they modeled for us that the Bible is a place where you come to look for a little devotional nugget that inspires the heart and encourages you. As I got into high school, other leaders would sit and they would talk with groups of us, and the verses that they would set before the group were all about how we needed to behave as teenagers. It was all about you need to be doing this and you don't need to be doing that. And they presented the Bible primarily as a book of behavior modification. The message came through loud and clear whether they were saying it that if you behave, God accepts you. And if you do not behave, God does not accept you. And they were teaching what Christian Smith has called moralistic therapeutic deism. If you want to have some fun later this afternoon, you can Google that term. But as I went to college, as I got a little bit older, I met people on my college campus who viewed the Bible predominantly as a book of theology. The scriptures were like a, a textbook, no different than our textbooks in biology or in chemistry. And it was the place where you came to understand the character and the nature of God. Uh, but these, these, these friends of mine, they would come to the Bible and they would use it primarily as kind of this tool for debate. And they got into arguments about all of the nuances of theology, but it, but it never seemed to be the place where they would come to know God in an intimate way or a personal way. And you know, while there are certain aspects of those approaches that at times can be helpful in coming to the Bible, each of them misses the big picture. Because the Bible isn't a book where we come to simply get bits of devotional fulfillment or bits of morality or, or bits of theology. The Bible is ultimately about God and his grand story of redemption that crescendos in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to miss Christ in the scriptures, even if you get so much of it right, is to miss the entire point. I love the way that the Anglican bishop J.C. Ryle said it when he wrote this. Let it be a settled principle in our minds in reading the Bible that Christ is the central son of the whole book. So long as we keep him in view, we shall never greatly err. But once we lose sight of Jesus, we shall find the whole book dark and full of difficulty. 
The key of the Bible is Jesus Christ. You see, Cleopas and his companion had many insights into the scriptures. They had great knowledge of of the works of Moses and the prophets, and yet they had missed the true Messiah in that moment. They had missed that it was necessary, key word, that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory. Jesus' suffering and death was necessary to accomplish our salvation. The cross was no mistake, but it was always a part of God's plan from the very beginning. And what Jesus does is he opens up the scriptures for them, and beginning with Moses and into the minor and the major prophets, I love the word that Luke uses there, he says that he interpreted or he exegeted And he reasonably explained how all of those texts culminate with him. Now notice it's it's not some of the scriptures, but all of the scriptures point us to Christ. All of the Bible centers around Jesus. In the Old Testament, he is the promised seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. He is the ark that rescues the people of God. He is the seed of Abraham in whom all peoples of the earth will be blessed. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the ultimate Passover lamb. He is the scapegoat who takes away our sins. He is the prophet who is greater than Moses. He is the pillar of fire in the wilderness and the rock struck by Moses. He is the true bronze serpent who we must look to. He is the heir to David's throne. In Isaiah, he is the holy, holy, holy God of chapter 6. He is the suffering servant who was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. He is the greater shepherd who tends to his people and he walks with us in the valley. In the New Testament, he is Mary's son, Herod's enemy, and Simeon's joy. He is the 12-year-old boy in the temple and the beloved son baptized in the Jordan River. He is the healer of the blind, the provider for the hungry, and the friend of the outcast. He is the new temple the source of living water, the manna that gives life, the light of the world, the resurrection and the life, and the Father's true vine. He is the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. And hope is always founded in Christ and in his word. To have an intimacy with Christ is to have an intimacy with the Bible. I love the the way that Dinsdale Young put it this way. He says, I cannot overstate the significance of the fact that our Lord's primary concern when he rose from the dead was the Bible. Too great attention cannot be called to our Savior's holy enthusiasm for the word of God. He cleaves to it with all the old affection and he came up from the grave and he hastened to the holy book. Love that. He hastened to the scriptures. He was tethered to the text. And you see, the disciples saw only through the events that they could perceive. But Jesus saw through the lens of the scriptures. He fulfilled not some, but all that the Old Testament had prophesied about the Messiah and his suffering and his dying and in his rising. And you see, to the degree that our lives are shaped by the scriptures, that will be the degree to which our lives are shaped and formed by the very hope of Christ. If we want to live lives that radiate with gospel hope, we've got to pour our lives into the word of God. And it's got to move from our minds and the intellect into our hearts and its affections and pour itself out in a life that is centered on Christ where he is the focus and he is the goal. And so let me ask you, as we close, What lens are you putting before your eyes? So we go back into the examination room. Is it lens one or is it two? Is it one or is it two? Are you living your life by your own interpretations and perceptions? Or are you looking to the place that lasting hope is found? Into all of the scriptures and to the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, you say, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Lord, how we pray that you would keep us from being those who know many things about the Bible, but miss the most important thing. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on the Christ of the word, and to see that our hope is not in what we can perceive in life, but in what your word reveals. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.